Some people think that numbers exist. It's an old idea. It goes back at least as far as Pythagoras. But it's an idea that never gets old, and there are still people who accept this idea. The idea is called mathematical realism, or mathematical Platonism. Now let's be sure we understand this idea properly. We are not talking about this thing. This is just a symbol. It exists. The question is whether what it stands for exists. And we're also not talking about this thing. This again is just a symbol. Naturally it exists. But what mathematical realists believe is not that the symbol for 3 exists, but that 3 itself exists. Now here is a set of three things. And here is another set of three things. These sets of things exist, but what mathematical realists think is that three itself exists, not just sets of three things. And mathematical realists, note well, think that it exists independently of our minds, or at least a vast majority of them think that. The British empiricist tradition tends to reject mathematical realism. Let's review what is called Hume's fork, which is fairly typical of British empiricist thinking. Hume says, all knowledge is either a matter of fact or a relation of ideas. Matters of fact are known from experience, and they are inherently uncertain. Relations of ideas are certain, and they are not known from experience. All truths about the world outside the mind are matters of fact. Relations of ideas only describe the ways our minds work. They don't correspond to any non-mental reality. And the truths of mathematics, in Hume's analysis, are, of course, all relations of ideas. Note well what this means. If Hume is correct, not only do numbers not exist, but the entire discipline of mathematics has for its subject matter nothing but patterns of human thought. Note further what this means. If Hume is correct, we could redefine the entire discipline of mathematics as a branch of psychology. Now that just doesn't seem right. The truths of mathematics are defined as being mind-dependent, as depending on us, not dependent on any kind of reality outside of our minds, or independent of our minds, and it seems that we could redefine mathematics as a branch of psychology. And that seems somewhere between strange and crazy to most of us. Kant's epistemology, Immanuel Kant, doesn't seem to do much better in this regard. While Kant is someone I tend to agree with over Hume, or prefer over Hume at least, in most respects, one thing Kant's theory of knowledge, as far as I can understand it, will not do for numbers, is tell us that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true for any reason independent of the way our minds work. Kant is complicated and uh, subtle, but if I'm not mistaken, he will not affirm that the truths of mathematics are independent of our perceptions, or independent of the ways our minds work. So a Kantian rejection of mathematical realism would likewise reduce mathematics to psychology, or at least make it possible for us to redefine mathematics as a branch of psychology, which again seems to most of us strange, if not crazy. Is there an alternative? Maybe. I admit I myself have not studied this topic in contemporary philosophy. There may be an alternative theory according to which the truths of mathematics are independent of our minds. Now here's one that might seem to work. Look at set theory. Maybe you could reduce numbers to sets of physical objects. I have here this set of three pens, and I have here another set of three pens, and uh, here's a set of three writing utensils, and in fact here are three sets of three writing utensils. And maybe you could say that uh, the rule that three times three times three equals nine, now I have nine writing utensils, Maybe you could say that that law of mathematics reduces to the laws that govern the behavior of these physical things. Uh, so numbers are not real, but sets of things are real, and they are governed by physical laws in such a way as to ensure that 3 times 3 always equals 9, and this is the foundation for the truths of mathematics in physical laws, and numbers themselves do not exist. Now, I freely confess this seems like a pretty good explanation to me of the existence uh, of the non-existence of numbers but the mind independence of mathematical truth. What holds me back is the truths of geometry. You should know that this is not a triangle. 
I always have fun drawing one of these on a whiteboard and asking my students what it is. Uh, as a general rule, they say it's a triangle, but they're always wrong. And this, you see, is only a picture of a triangle. Now, one minor problem is that the lines are not 100% straight, just 99 point something percent. And the angles probably don't add up to exactly 180 degrees, just very, very close to 180. The big problem here is that a real triangle is made up of line segments, which have no width. That means you cannot see them. You can see this thing. Therefore, this is not a triangle. And neither is any other so-called triangle you've ever seen. If you try to simply reduce the truths about triangles to the ways our minds work, you seem to run into the same problem Hume runs into. You make the truths of geometry dependent on our minds, and you could redefine geometry as a branch of psychology. Can you reduce the truths of geometry to sets of physical objects? Unlike with mathematics, I don't see how this could possibly work. It might work for numbers because numbers correspond numbers correspond to sets of physical objects, but there's no such correspondence for triangles. Now, could you reduce the truths of geometry to the shapes of physical objects? Well, not exactly, because no triangles are physical objects. Could you say that the truths of geometry are generalizations or abstractions from the physical laws which govern the shapes of physical objects? Um, here some, here's a rectangular object. And if I remove some of the sticky notes, I have um, all these different rectangular objects. And physical laws seem to govern them with a certain amount of consistency. And maybe that's where the truths of geometry come from, from the physical laws that govern these rectangular objects and similarly for squarish objects and triangular objects. Well, what about the Pythagorean theorem itself? What about the truths, uh, the exact truths of geometry? The truth that the angles of a rectangle add up to uh, 180 times to 360 degrees. This is uh, an eternal truth, but these angles will not add up to exactly that. These angles add up to something very close, but not exactly that. These generalizations or abstractions from physical laws might, might seem to explain uh, the truths of geometry, but the generalizations or abstractions are themselves mental actions. So if you go this way and deny the existence of mind-independent geometrical realities, deny the existence of triangles and squares as non-physical objects, the kind Pythagoras believed in, and after in Plato, if you go that way, it seems you're once again back to redefining geometry as a branch of psychology. You've said that the truths of geometry itself, the truths themselves of geometry, depend on the mind. The, uh, the physical laws that we are getting them from describe with a high degree of consistency the behavior of objects that have these shapes, but the truths themselves, the Pythagorean theorem itself, that a squared plus b squared equals c squared uh, with the sides of a triangle, these truths themselves would not describe any physical thing and they would be creations of the mind. So that seems to count in favor of geometrical realism. And if triangles exist, it seems likely enough that numbers existed as well. I myself have a very hard time imagining that triangles might exist, but not the number three. So this would also seem to count in favor of mathematical realism and in favor of including numbers in our ontology. But this is by no means the final word on the matter. This is Nothing but an introduction to this topic with references to a few characters in the history of philosophy. Those who are interested in pursuing this topic further would do well to look into the discussion of it among contemporary philosophers. If you want to do that, I suggest you consider these articles from the online encyclopedias of philosophy. You could pause the video and type them in your browser, and they would be a great place to start studying this topic further if you are interested.